start with some misinformation. That's always a fun idea. There's this idea you'll run into out in the wild that Hamlet, the play, was inspired by Shakespeare's son, Hamnet, who had died from plague. You'll find this kind of nonsense banded about on a bunch of high school level resources on Shakespeare, and it does kind of pique our pseudobiographical interests. But it's not true. Not really. I mean, it's not very subtle. No, this isn't about Hamnet, it's about Ham. Let. Bit on the nose, right? Your dentist's name is Crentist. Maybe that's why he became a dentist. The name of the play comes from the source material. There's a much older Scandinavian myth about Hamlet that Shakespeare is drawing directly from, and that's where he gets the name. Second, Shakespeare's son, who really was named Hamnet, probably didn't die of plague. For one thing, there isn't a record of plague outbreak in Stratford in 1596 when Hamnet died. For another, in the Elizabethan period, kids die kind of a lot. Like, like one in three children die in the period. More likely some random accident or illness or something. Third, Hamlet was written probably about 1601, five years after Hamnet's death. Shakespeare's living in London, writing comedies when his son dies. In fact, after he hears the news, the first play he wrote was Merry Wives of Windsor. Not really your typical morning fare. Still, I think there's maybe something to this theory. Now, now to be clear, Hamlet is not inspired by Hamnet. But we still can't miss the central feeling that drives this whole play. Grief. Hamlet's father has died. He comes home for a funeral and finds himself at a wedding instead, his widowed mother's wedding, to the new king. This really leaves him no place to mourn. He can't mourn the loss of his father or something private with his family because his family's celebrating a new marriage. He can't mourn the loss of the king as something public with the rest of society because society is celebrating the coronation of a new king. Hamlet's there all decked out in black and people are giving him a hard time for being all emo. And he's like, dude, my dad just died. And everyone's like, Pfft, Whatever hot topic, get over it. Even readers do this. We all seem to think Hamlet's problem is depression or, or madness or something. Dude's problem is that he's grieving. And really, it's the rest of the world that's gone mad. You ever get that feeling that you're the only person who hasn't lost it? Like the whole world's just gone crazy and they're looking at you like you're the one with the problem. That's Hamlet. But that feeling of grief goes a lot deeper than that. Really, to get a good sense of it, we have to take a little detour through theory to better understand the tragedy as a genre. There are a few major schools of thought in here. Literary theory has kind of a thing for tragedy. We've been theorizing drama as long as uh, dramas existed, really. Some scholars even say that the ideal modality for stage, if there can be such a thing, is the tragedy. Tragedy maximizes the potential work of this medium to the full extent. And Hamlet, and probably King Lear too, is one of the richest examples of this genre. Let's look at four of the major theoretical approaches. Now, some of these will better align with future texts we'll look at later in the term, so be sure to come back to these notes later. Theorizing tragedy goes all the way back to Aristotle. Poetics is a foundational text in literary criticism. Here, Aristotle lays out six main elements of tragedy. Now, Aristotle is talking about the ancient Greek tragedy of his own culture, and there's no reason to think it must apply to all tragedies of all time. Uh, genre is an emergent thing that transforms in every age. But because his writing was so influential on art and philosophy, we can certainly see these echoes and elements of Shakespeare's work as well. So for Aristotle, these are kind of in order of importance. First, plot. The trajectory of the play hinges on a reversal of fortune that leads towards suffering. We are going to end badly. If the comedy is marked symbolically with a wedding, the tragedy is marked symbolically with a death at the end. And this death must be the main character. Second, about that main character, he should be generally a good person, consistent in his actions and acting appropriately for his status and stage in life. Uh, it helps if this person is of high-born status, that way their downfall represents the larger downfall of society as a whole. If it can happen to the king, then it can happen to me too. Importantly, the downfall of the character comes as a result of his own actions. A uh, tragic flaw. Now, the tragic flaw isn't something like a deficiency of character. It's not like, like Hamlet's greedy or something. He's a flawed character, something like that. The word Aristotle uses is hamartia, the same word the New Testament translates as sin, a word we in English stole from archery practice. It literally means to miss the target. The tragic flaw is a free action the character does, often with the best intentions, that sparks a series of events that leads to their own destruction. Once we have the character, we have the third element thought. This is anterior to speech, 
explains the character's motivations and actions, really anything that reveals to us what the character intends to do, so that we can weigh that against what actually happens. And this we often find what's called dramatic irony. The character says what they intend, but we, the audience, will know will end otherwise. So, for example, Horatio pleads with Hamlet not to follow the ghost because he's afraid it'll lead him to a high cliff, terrify him into some madness, and then Hamlet will jump off. And Hamlet's like, nah, bro, don't worry about it. But really, that's exactly what happens. Hamlet is perceived as mad, may really become so, and ends up dead at the end of the play. And really, it's all the ghost's fault. Following thought, we have diction, the actual speech of the character, interaction between characters. This is where most of the action of the play happens. There's really not much else to say about diction, it's just the words. Following diction, Aristotle puts the chorus. On the ancient Greek stage, the chorus was a group of people that would speak directly to the audience to explain what was really going on. So Oedipus, for example, thinks, I'm going to escape my fate and go rule this foreign kingdom. He says, diction, I will marry Jocasta. And the chorus looks at the audience and is like, dude, that's your mom. His mama! The chorus has the job of telling us what's really going on in spite of the intentions of the characters and beyond the things they say and do. Finally, tragedy employs spectacle. The special effects, props, costumes, sets, the material junk on the stage that helps sell the story. This element is the least important for Aristotle, but still plays an important role in helping the audience immerse themselves in the story. Now, all of these elements are directed toward one thing in the tragedy, affecting catharsis. Really, the whole point of the tragedy is catharsis, and this recognition is one of the reasons Aristotle has had such staying power in literary theory. Catharsis literally means purging, the burning away of negative or self-destructive impulses, things we all have but know we can't act on. For example, Hamlet has a desire to avenge the death of his father. We've all wanted to, to get even for some wrong done to us, but the truth is getting even will likely land us in hot water. We have a sense for justice, especially concerning ourselves, but seeking vengeance will inevitably lead others desiring vengeance against us. So instead of fulfilling these revenge fantasies, we repress them. We bury them in the subconscious where they can't or won't hurt anybody. But of course, that's not a sustainable practice. If we keep pushing our feelings down over and over and over again, eventually we'll explode. We need an outlet. That outlet is the tragedy. Here we can see a character, someone we sympathize with, we see ourselves in, fulfill this desire we know we should repress, and then they die. The rest is silent. Blah. And when they die, our desire to seek vengeance dies too. It's a bit like the concept of a scapegoat. We place our sins on Hamlet, and Hamlet bears the consequences for us. As a member of the audience, the play draws to the surface all my repressed desires and gives me a safe place where I can feel them all. As if by proxy, I watch Hamlet feel my feelings and act on them. When Hamlet dies as a result of these actions, my feelings can finally come to closure. I have not had my own vengeance, but I have had the satisfaction, the endorphin rush, of seeing all these feelings off to their end. So, tragedy is designed to produce catharsis. The viewer, ideally, by watching the main character with whom we sympathize undergo a radical reversal of fortune. One more trick here for Aristotle. The tragic hero recognizes the depth of their own fall. They, too, have a kind of catharsis by looking back at the flawed actions and saying, Oh, yeah, that's how I got here. Too bad. This is called anagoresis. Literally means not unknowing. So Laertes, Hamlet's tragic double, says as he's laying dying from his own poison blade, Why has a wood cop to mine own spring, Josric? I am justly killed with mine own treachery. He realizes that his own scheming has led to his downfall. We might call anagoresis a recognition, or maybe a recognition, rethinking or rendering again the events of the play, but now with a new awareness of their importance. In this sense, the world of the play hasn't changed so much as the character within the play. If the comedy is about the revolutions of the status quo, tragedy is about the radical upheaval of the self caught within the status quo. In an important way, then, tragedy is the anti-comedy. We don't look for reconciliation between thesis and antithesis, or abstract and negation. We instead look for the failure of that reconciliation. This is where the next major move in our study of tragedy comes in. Hegel. Now, you've heard me talk about Hegel enough by this point that you're familiar with his general system. The premise is really simple. Every system of thought 
Every framework we have for understanding the world comes with contradictions embedded in it. These contradictions are not always obvious, but become apparent to us when we begin to articulate our beliefs about the world. When we encounter a contradiction, our job is to rethink the system until the contradiction is accounted for, which leads us to a transformation of the system as a whole. This is the process by which history progresses. So classic example, capitalism. The unarticulated system values the individual person and the products they create, their, their property, above the social communal whole. But contradiction, the individual can't exist without the social or communal. I mean, how many of you planted and harvested and spun and wove the cotton of the shirt you're wearing? And if you did, where'd you get the seeds? The individual needs the social, a contradiction for a system that builds from the autonomy of the individual. If you're looking closely, you can see that this is the basic comic plot as well. Unarticulated system, the status quo, contradiction, negation, reconciliation, the new status quo, or Sino. Status quo, unarticulated system, needs a wife. Contradiction falls in love with Cesario, a man. The resolution can only come when the contradiction is articulated, is brought into the open. Cesario outs himself as Viola, and this system transforms. Orsino does not just need a wife, he needs a person whom he loves. Or Beatrice, unarticulated, a strong, independent woman. Contradiction, strong, independent women are poor matches in marriage. Either conform or be excluded from the social order. Reconciliation, Benedict. A person who loves her for being strong-willed and independent. You get it. But the tragedy for Hegel is a little different. It's not merely a failed reconciliation. Ultimately, for Hegel, nothing will stop the inevitable transformation of history. No, tragedy emerges when a person is caught between the wheels of transforming systems. For Hegel, tragedy happens when a character must choose between two equally valid ethical systems, the old and fading, and the new and emerging. There's a moment when the ethics of each system will present themselves as the right thing to do, and the character will be caught. He's damned if he does, damned if he doesn't. So, for example, the ghost of old Hamlet emerges and gives Hamlet a chance to avenge his death. But to do so will certainly lead to his own death. He's going to have to become a regicide. That's not really something you get away with. His choice is now either to fail in his filial, familial responsibilities to his father, or to fail in his social patriotic responsibilities to the king. Any action he takes will be a violation of one of these ethical demands. Either way, he's set to fail. There's no way out except not to act. This is probably why Hamlet spends most of the play moping around not doing anything. Any action he takes will lead him toward the tragic end. So following Hegel, Friedrich Nietzsche sees the tragedy as a competition between two worlds, but in a very different way. For Nietzsche, the fundamental reality of the world is chaos, disorder, meaninglessness, blind forces of nature that work without rhyme or reason. When we look at the world, our first impulse is to make sense of it all, to, to create a system, as Hegel might, that blunts the edge of this chaotic madness. But that system is a facade. It's a thin veneer of rationality stretched precariously over the deeper reality. Nothing means anything. This applies to everything we think of as part of a rational order, up to in and including self-identity. And yeah, Nietzsche is aware this applies to his own philosophy as well. Even this existentialist anti-system is part of the veneer. It's part of the great cosmic joke. The only difference is Nietzsche knows he's a part of it. It's only a matter of time before chaos ruptures the veneer and the true disorder of the world shows itself again. So the tragedy is about the collision of these two worlds, the fabricated, ordered, meaningful world in the real chaotic, meaningless world. Tragedy strips away our tidy systems and gives us bare fact, nothing. It's in this that the catharsis happens. When we come face to face with the deconstruction of all systems, the reminder that in the end, there is no escape from the chaotic ruptures of our world and the downfall of the precarious house of cards we call identity. But this is the only way we can live an authentic life without deluding ourselves. By looking at the chaos of the world, and not trying to bend it into something meaningful, but instead to recognize it for what it is, to stare into the abyss and not make sense of it. I, I mean, think about it. There are more things in heaven and earth that are dreamt of in our philosophies. The ghost starts us off with a world of revenge, and where do we end? With a bunch of other ghosts. Horatio bearing Hamlet's body to the stage to repeat the drama again and again and again in an infinite regress of repetition, but in none of them will Hamlet ever be alive at the end. And no matter what, Denmark is no better off. Fortinbras is king at the end regardless. 
all Hamlet's plans, his hesitations, his sincere heartfelt deliberations about life and its meaning, to be or not to be, he ends up dead. Laertes, dead. Polonius, dead. Ophelia, dead. Claudius, dead. Gertrude, dead. Friendship, dead. Fatherhood, dead. Love, dead. Power, dead. Duty, dead. Even the entire system of national identity, dead. Fortinbras is king and holds a court full of corpses. All of this leaves us one major overriding sense. Waste. What a waste. The final step for us here comes from early 20th century Shakespeare scholar named A.C. Bradley. The catharsis of the play could be directed toward many specific feelings. Vengeance, lust, ambition, arrogance, selfishness. But these feelings are always carried along by a sense that, gosh, it didn't have to be this way. At least in Shakespeare's tragedies, Bradley argues, there's always a hint that things could have been different. Some alternate universe where Hamlet and Ophelia live happily ever after, Claudius comes clean, the ghost finds rest, and Denmark has a bright and stable future. But that world can't exist. And no matter how great Hamlet could be, he's got to die. And no matter how wonderful life may have been, it can't happen. And it's really the heaviness of that feeling of waste that makes catharsis possible for us. Waste, rupture, contradiction, catharsis. There are a lot of ways this plays out in Hamlet. But here's my thesis. Hamlet is ultimately about coming to terms with grief. Not individual grief only, as maybe the grief of a father losing his son, but a collective grief of a culture as a whole that has failed to reconcile its multiple contradictions and is about to face a reckoning. Something is rotten in the state of Denmark, and by St. Patrick, it's about to rise with a vengeance. But that, I'm sorry to say, we'll have to wait until next week. <laughs>